Hi, I'm Dave, and I'm the lead pastor here at New Life. And I just want to welcome you to our service. For me, there's no better place to be. And if you'd like to know more information about how to connect and different things that are going on, make sure you check down below. And hit that like button, hit that subscribe button so you can see new services as they come online. So now, rather than sitting around, let's join in. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame? They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came. And he died, and he rose, those giants are dead now. This is our God, this is who he is, he loves us. This is our God, this is what he does, he saves us. All across, lead the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God. That took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But he heard every word, every whisper I want you to turn today to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament, the latter half of the Bible. And so I want you to turn to Matthew uh, chapter 21. Last week, we kicked off our Easter series. So we're going to be doing this all through Easter and a few weeks beyond called Jesus Changes Everything. And, And what we're looking at here is how Jesus really is the author or the architect of transformation, in us. And if you remember, we said that every single day, you and I are being shaped and formed. There's like pressure that comes in our world to mold us and shape us 
into its own image, right? So culture is shaping us. Our, our parents are shaping us, even if you're an adult. Our kids uh, have, a, have a shaping, kind of forming part of us. Our past, our decisions, all of these things go into molding us. But we read in scripture, and the apostle Paul reminded us that we can take intentional steps, intentional steps, to be instead shaped and formed into the image, into the likeness of Jesus. Not to be Jesus, but to be like Jesus. And that deep internal change of heart and behavior and attitude and soul can only come from him and nothing else. We can't educate our, our way into it. We can't somehow diet our way into it. We, we can't you know, shift our personality. It all comes down to Jesus. And are we willing to walk with him? Remember his invitation to the disciples, come and follow me, come and walk with me. And so he's saying that to us today, come, follow me, walk with me. And in that relationship and in that walking step by step, we become more and more shaped and formed like him. We, we talked about how Paul used this word to be formed like Christ. And it's it's this word really of metamorphosis. That's the Greek word behind it. And that, that change and transformation, that metamorphosis, is also the expectation when we choose to follow Jesus. Nowhere in scripture do you see, yeah, just believe, and I, you know, that's good enough, and I'll just kind of do, do what I do. No, no, no. Jesus has come closer. Come walk with me. Know me. And in that knowing, in that in that walk, there is this transformation that takes place. So I want to continue that conversation today and this work, this reforming that takes place in us. Whenever Jesus is close, whenever Jesus is near, and I don't mean that in like a time sensitive, like sometimes he's close and sometimes he's not close, right? It's that as we enter into a deeper relationship with him, there is that work that's done. And last week we wrestled with that phrase, until Christ is formed in you, or the more personal, until Christ is formed in me. And, and what does that look like? So on this Palm Sunday, I want you to think about this. If, you're, if you have your sheet out there, you'll see this as the big idea, and it's this. When Jesus comes close, when we lean into him and we, and we are deepening that relationship, he challenges the deepest parts of me. He's not just going to leave me be. He's not going to say, hey, well, you know, whatever works for you. He's going to, he's going to point out, he's going to begin to unravel those things that have held us so tight that have maybe even held us captive. And he's going to begin to do his work and challenge these deepest parts in me to be reformed more and more like him. And so we're going to, we're going to dive into that by looking at this Palm Sunday from Scripture. It's in Matthew 21. And how Jesus is really introduced into Jerusalem as the king, as the Messiah, and as the savior, and all that took place with that. So before we dive into that, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been introduced to a group of people? Now, I'm going to guess most of us have in some way. Maybe you went over to a friend's house, and there's, you're going to have a, a dinner or a party together, and you come in, and they go, hey, everyone, uh, this is Dave. want to introduce you, and you know, come in and people know you, or if you've ever been introduced to a crowd of people, it's like a whole different scenario, and you kind of don't know what's going to happen. A crowd going, hey, I wanted to, this is Dave, and then there's silence, and they're like, oh, man, like, what does that mean? Or that part where you'd want people to go, yeah, all right, nice to meet you, know, glad you're here kind of a thing. Like, what do we do? And, and the different responses actually show a lot about us and what's going on in our heart. See, some of you are extroverts. And so if you were introduced, you'd want people to go, woo, yeah, yeah, and you'll go, hey, it's, it's great to be here, you know, kind of a thing. And some of you are more introverts, and so if you got introduced to a crowd, you'd want to go, hey, hi, you know, don't make a big deal of this, you know, it's like you, you want to shrink back a little bit. But all of us have been in those situations, but imagine walking into some, some type of crowd, some type of event where you're introduced and people just go nuts. Like, what would that feel like? What would that be like? What would it like to be in the crowd when, when people are cheering and doing that? Well, today we get to look at one of the greatest public entrances in all of history. And it's the lead-in to Easter and the beginning of literally a history-changing week. 
We tend to focus on, on Easter and maybe Good Friday, but all through this week, we get to travel together with Jesus as he makes his way to the cross and ultimately to his resurrection. But this Palm Sunday, this triumphal entry, as it's often called, what is it really about? What, what's really going on? Well, it was, it was something that had really never been experienced before. They, there had been no question at this point, like, has the Messiah come or the rescuer? Has, has the one who's going to save us? Has, is it actually going to be here? Now, remember, for the Jews, they had been waiting for countless generations all the way back, all the way back to the beginning, going, someday, someday a Messiah, a rescuer, a savior is going to come. And will, will we recognize him? And there were all these prophecies that were given in the Old Testament of what to look for. And now they're wondering, is, man, is, is Jesus it? Because they, they're going to be pretty familiar with Jesus. He's been teaching for several years. People have heard about his miracles. They've heard about people that were blind that are now seeing, people who were lame that are now walking. I mean, this, there's a buzz around Jesus as he comes into the city in Jerusalem on this day. So if you're there in Matthew chapter 21, we're going to start at verse 1, and we're going to read a little bit into this. It says, as Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage. Can you say that? There you go. We want to say Bethphage, but it's not. On the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said, and as soon as you enter it, now catch this, you're going to see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone asks about you, anyone asks what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. Now, we're going to keep reading, but I want to pause there just for a moment. This is kind of a weird scenario, right? Whoever owns this donkey and the colt does not know the disciples, does not know the two that, that show up, and Jesus says, just go there, untie them, and, and bring them back to me. And if someone says, hey, like, what are you doing? Because you can imagine the owner coming out going, oh, time out. What are you doing? Like, these are mine. Like, what do you think? And they would just say, the Lord needs them. And they'll immediately let you take them. Now, I want to let you know that this is a one and done situation. Like, don't go down the street to your neighbor's car and go, the Lord needs it, you know, and it's not, it's not going to work, you know, but in this situation, it's like, that in itself is like this little miracle, like who in the world would do that? But it, they take the donkey and the colt and they go back. And then it says this, this took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. And he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. And the two disciples did as Jesus commanded, and they brought the donkey and the colt to him. And they threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. And most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And Jesus was in the center of this procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the son of David. Blessings on the one who came, comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. And the entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So we're going to stop right there. So I want to highlight a couple things. One, it's like, why is this called Palm Sunday? Well, in this version, this translation of scripture, they talk about branches from trees. But tradition has it, and, and other versions talk about palm branches that they had cut, which would have been... Palms represented royalty, and so when they cut these palm branches, it was recognizing his kingship as they laid these uh, on the ground for uh, the donkey's colt to walk over with Jesus. And so it had significance and meaning for them as they saw this unfold. And people were cheering, and uh, this version of the Bible actually translates the word, but some versions you'll see it, it says Hosanna. And Hosanna was this this meaningful word make, made up of two parts, but it really had to do with the one who has come to save us and this urgency to it, like, save us, please, save us now. And so they're, they're saying this, praise God, he's come to save us and to rescue us and to, and to redeem us. 
And they're cheering and cheering and cheering, which I think is really interesting because you get to the end of this and it says the entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he enters. And yet what are some people asking? Hey, who, who is this guy? I mean, they're cheering and they're doing all of this and you can imagine them kind of in the back of a crowd and they're going, yay, yay, yay. Who are we cheering for? Like, like they don't even know, right? And, and they enter in and they go, it's Jesus, this prophet, this teacher from Nazareth and Galilee. Now, so many times in this one little pack, passage right here, it is highlighting prophecy from the Old Testament. We don't really recognize it, but when it talks about from Nazareth, when it talks about Jerusalem, like celebrating, when it talked about the words that they would say and him riding on a colt, these were all things from the Old Testament. So the people who were savvy in this were recognizing these are all the signs of the Messiah. Now it was an incredible entrance. Thousands of people lining the street because they think the Messiah has come. And when they said Messiah, they're thinking the one who's going to save us and rescue us. And you know that somewhere in their heart and in their mind, they're thinking, finally, after generations and generations, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, we've been waiting, our grandparents, our great-grandparents going all the way back, and he's finally here. Because where this was coming from is they were being oppressed by the Roman government, by the Roman Empire at that time. And their rights and their freedoms were, were being oppressed and all this. But even after all these years, they had hope. And they were completely confident that a change, that a transformation, cultural-wide, was about to take place. And here they are laying their coats on the road, waving palm branches, doing all that, saying, praise God, he's here to save us and to rescue us. And in their mind, they're going, because finally, these Romans are going to get what's coming to them. Finally, these Romans are gonna get pushed out. And this new rescuer, this new savior, he's gonna set up a new kingdom and a new rule and a new way of doing things. And he's gonna put us back in control of everything. Now we don't read that in scripture, but you know when they lived in this oppressive way, what they were expecting was a government overthrow. And they realized that this is exactly how a crowd would have greeted and celebrated a true, genuine, strong warrior king, the one that they'd waited for. Isaiah and Zechariah had prophesied all about this. But Jesus sits into the city, and they see him coming on this colt of a donkey. And so I'm, I'm going to speculate here. This is not in Scripture, okay? So I'm just trying to put myself in the shoes there. There had to be a little part where you were going, this, this is it? Like, I think I was expecting something, brah, you know, shock and awe, right? I'm expecting, you know, the big stallion coming in with a sword. I'm expecting something way more impressive to happen. And I'm looking at Jesus coming in on this donkey's colt, and it's like, man, I think we need a little bit more shock and awe here. I think we need something like a little bit more. Have you ever expected to see something really amazing and then it let you down? Have you ever had someone tell you, this movie, oh, <laughs> it's amazing. You should go see this movie. And all your friends are going, you got to see this movie. And then you see it and you go, eh, I don't know. It was, it was okay. Or someone tells you, you need to go see this over here, this thing. It, it's absolutely amazing. And you get there and it's like, wah, wah. you know, it's just... <laughs> So back a few years ago when our oldest daughter lived in the Boston area, uh, we were going back to see her. And so we're thinking, what, are you gonna, what can we see in the Boston area? Of course, there's the Freedom Trail and all these different things. Wonderful. And one of the things was like, you know, we're only like 20 minutes from Plymouth Rock, like where the pilgrims landed, you know, the Mayflower and all those kinds of things. And so we drove to Plymouth, Massachusetts. My whole life I've heard about Plymouth Rock. And in my mind, Plymouth Rock was like, Plymouth Rock, right? They landed there and it was just this, the entrance to America and all these things. Have any of you seen Plymouth Rock? Yeah. So when, when you come up to it, when you come up to it, it's, it's under this whole like uh, Greek uh, kind of like these columns and it's, I mean, it looks like, whoa. And then you go up to it and this is not a joke. It's about the size of this tabletop. 
and someone has chiseled 1620 into it. And so you see this like structure in the columns and, and you go up, literally everyone that goes up goes, is, is that it? Like that's the whole thing, Plymouth Rock? Like you can't even fit one person on that. I mean, it just, it is such a, it's such a, such a downer, such, such a disappointment to see. Now, I don't know that Jesus was that kind of a disappointment, but you know that there had to be people going, I, I know, you know, the, the prophecy said that he would come righteous and lowly riding on the colt of a donkey. I know, I know it said that, but I was expecting something so different, you know, powerful and mighty and overwhelming. And, and I'm sure they were looking at Jesus and, you know, these fishermen that were following him and this little donkey and going, how are we going to defeat the Romans with that? Like, how is that going to establish a, a new kingdom? And they're, yay, Jesus, Hosanna, but come on. And it's crazy for me to think, that on one day they celebrated him, probably with some reservations. But five days later, they were asking for his execution. They were asking for him to be crucified and give up his life. But see, the, the issue is, is that Jesus didn't come to establish a political kingdom. He didn't come to overthrow the government. He didn't come to set up a new, a new palace and a new throne. He came to establish a different kind of kingdom, a different way of living. And now I see how they can shift from celebrating him to clamoring for his execution because you didn't measure up, Jesus. You didn't bring what we wanted. How come you're not doing what we want you to do? And if you can't do that, then you must not be the king because you're not here to fix it the way that you think you should fix it. I want you to fix it the way that I think you should fix it. I want you to change some things. I'm tired of suffering. I'm tired of going through this. Jesus, I want it to be different. And 2,000 years later, we say the same kinds of things. We want Jesus to fit into our mold. We want Jesus to do what we want him to do. Last week I told you there's this phrase that, that we have come to, to love and, uh, in some ways and be challenged by it in others of his will, his way, his time. His will in my life, his way, how he wants to accomplish it, and in his timing. And that's what I want to pray. But I got to tell you, there's this part of me that fights that because the truth is I, I want my will and I want him to do it my way and I definitely want him to do it in my time. But that's not why Jesus came. Jesus came for something different. See, we say, I'll follow you, Jesus, as long as there's something in it for me right now. We say, well, I tried Jesus, but it didn't look or feel how I thought it should. Like, he, he didn't do what I wanted him to do. He didn't get me out of trouble. He didn't heal my family member. I still lost my job. Like, everything didn't suddenly click into place. So, like, where, what did I get out of the deal? And so we throw Jesus to the side. And the people back then, they thought Jesus was coming into town to shift it all, to change from Roman rule to Jewish rule. They thought Jesus was their politician. Here comes our candidate to change things up and get our nation back on track. And their vote was for Jesus as long as he came to do what they wanted. But Jesus came to fulfill his mission, not their mission. And Jesus' mission was to five days later go to a cross and give up his life and to hang between heaven and earth for their sin and for my sin and for your sin, to give us hope, to redeem us and to make us whole, to adopt us into his family. But he says, you're coming to me and my kingdom. You're, you're coming to, to, to be a part of, of, of what I'm bringing. And we wanna keep shoving Jesus into our own mold. And Jesus says, will you come to me? Will you follow me? And that's the challenge in this. Remember the big idea we talked about? When Jesus comes close, he challenges the deepest parts of me. And the question is, what are those deepest parts in you that are in opposition, that are in conflict with what Jesus wants to accomplish in you? What is it about his will and his way and his time that you are resisting and that you are pushing back from? 
And you're saying, he's come to be my rescuer and savior, but I want him to do it how I want him to do it. And Jesus is saying, oh man, oh, you are absolutely loved by me. But will you come and follow? Will you give up your efforts? Will you give up your striving and instead trust me? So I'm gonna give you two things. I want you to write these down today. The first is this. The presence of Jesus pushes sin from my life. Pushes sin from my life. Now, we're gonna read a passage again in, in Matthew a little further, but I want you to catch this because what, what we're saying is here, the closer and stronger my relationship with him becomes, the more of him and less of me. That's what Paul said. And yet it wasn't like Paul or, or us would lose our personality or our uniqueness or our gifts or skills, abilities, our sense of humor. It's, it's, not, it's not becoming some kind of clone, but it's saying, I want more of you at work in me. And when I begin to do that step by step, right, that's our mission, one step closer to Jesus, as I begin to do that, the less room there is in my life for my own rebellion and for sin to take root because there's only so much capacity I have in my heart and soul. So I want more of my life to reflect Jesus, to worship him, to thank him, to follow him, so that more and more of my life is aligned and in tune with him rather than my own sin and my own desires. See, when the presence of Jesus arrives, there, there is this pushing away of the things that are in conflict and rebellion to him. If you continue reading there, you'll see the very first thing that Jesus does when he arrives in the city is he goes to the temple. Now think about this. If you were a conquering king, if you had come into the city to establish your government, where would you go? You'd go to the palace. You'd go to where the throne is. You would go to the, to the seat of influence and power to say, I am here and I am king. And it's funny because Jesus went to the temple, which is actually the place of influence and power. It's actually the place where real things, eternal things take place. Jesus actually went to the most important place. And he goes there and he sees some things that, that are happening around him. Now remember, during this time, it's Passover, which if you're not familiar with that, is a, is a Jewish uh, tradition that continues to this day as they remember their slavery in Egypt and when Moses led them out into the promised land and all that. And there's a, a Seder meal, they call it, that they do to remember and to celebrate the Passover. So people had come into Jerusalem, thousands of people at this time, to, to celebrate this. And one of the things that they had to do was to bring a sacrifice to the altar at the temple. And so when you're traveling for who knows how long, for days, maybe even weeks to get there, uh, it was really hard to keep like, a bird or a sacrifice or whatever they were gonna give uh, along with them. So what they would do is they would just come to the city and then people, being people, right? Someone in there went, you know what? If we provided the sacrifices for them, we could charge crazy amounts of money because they, they have to have one, right? It's, it's this limited audience. And the thing is, is that we actually know what that feels like. Have you ever gone to Costco and bought the dollar, the, the hot dog and a soda for $1.50? You ever done that? Some of you are doing it today, I know. But <laughs> we go there for $1.50, right? And you get this big giant hot dog and you get a soda. It's like buck fifty. This is the best deal ever. Have you ever been to a concert or a sporting event and you go, they're charging me 14 bucks for a hot dog and then nine for a soda? It's like this is ridiculous, right? Because you're a captive audience when you're in that stadium. You're not at Costco. Well, the people coming here, they were like, what are we gonna do? And so these people were charging them all kinds of things. And sometimes there was this sacrifice or this gift of, of money, and so they'd have to change it. And these people were just ripping them off. And Jesus comes into the temple, and something just flares in Jesus. And it's holy, and it's righteous, and he sees what's going on, and he says, not in my house, not in my house. So here's what he says, starting in verse 12 in Matthew 21. Jesus entered the temple and he began to drive out all the people that were buying and selling animals for sacrifice. And he knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he said to him, 
Listen, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. And anyone who was knowledgeable at that time know that in that, in that sentence, Jesus has quoted two Old Testament prophets. One is that his temple would become a house of prayer to the nations. And Jesus was saying, man, you guys have turned this into something different, a den of thieves. You've taken true worship and you've, you've corrupted it. But my temple was meant to be open to everyone. And you know what? You and I are sitting here today because of what Jesus did. Not just what he did in the temple, but what he established right then is saying, my, my house of worship is for everyone. It's for you and it's for me. And we don't corrupt it and we don't subvert it and we don't, we don't cheapen it somehow by, by ripping people off. And Jesus came to establish something new. But he pushed out sin with his presence. He pushed out what was evil and what was wrong. And he wants to do the same thing in us. See, Jesus came and he cleared this sin from the temple. His presence came in, pushed that out. And today, the same thing can happen for you and me because the Bible says that you and I are now the temple. First Corinthians says, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and the spirit of God lives in you. He goes on to say, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself for God bought you with a high price. So honor God with your body. So Jesus comes in and says, I want to step into your temple and I want to begin to push out those things that are kind of aligned against me. I want to, I want to push out what is corrupting you. See, I think some of us need some tables knocked over in our thought life. We need the presence of Jesus to push away ego and pride, lust and greed, all those things that don't honor God. When we let him in, he begins to expose and come to terms and to begin to push out those things that corrupt us. Peter, in, in his letter, says clearly, judgment begins with the family of God. And today we know that the temple, the place where God's presence is, you and me, is what he wants to cleanse. It's what he wants to renew and restore and reform and make new. Write this down for number two. The presence of Jesus radically changes my perspective. Radically changes my perspective. I think a lot of the people there that day were doing what probably a lot of us would be doing if we were in their shoes. They wanted justice and they wanted relief from an overarching oppression government. And they wanted it now. And some were probably saying to Jesus what maybe you and I have said before when we see those people, right? We're really good at making distinctions. You know, those people, and maybe you've prayed these exact words, maybe you've thought these exact words, but it's like, Jesus, get them. Just get them. Like, take care of all that stuff. They're right over there, Jesus. Don't let them get away with all of that stuff, right? The Bible says, you know, Revenge is mine, says the Lord. Well, there they are. Get your revenge. Like, just do it right now. And I can imagine Jesus going, <laughs> laughing, right? And going, nope. The day of judgment will come. But right now, Jesus says, I'm here for you. I'm here to do a deeper work in you. And I'm reminded that I'm invited to be radically different, with a different perspective. And when I belong to Jesus, we keep saying this over and over, but he changes everything. Because when the presence of Jesus comes, there's a conviction that takes place. It causes us to take inventory. That his presence is humbling and it's strong and it's convicting. And like we said last week, it's powerful. And I may be following Jesus, but it doesn't mean that he doesn't hold me accountable to the things that keep me moving one step closer to him in relationship. We think he always has to be on my side and against those people. But in reality, Jesus is against sin wherever he finds it. He's not against you. He's against sin. And he's out to destroy anything that separates people from him and to do that transforming work in them. When the presence of Jesus comes close, our hearts get exposed. 
there's this unraveling, it's a word that Gina and I use, that all these things that we've held tightly to, God begins to unwind them, and things in us that maybe we didn't wanna see get exposed, because he wants our worship and he wants our obedience. But even more than that, he wants the daily moment by moment worship of obedience of a changed life. <coughs> when we follow Jesus, we're supposed to look different, noticeably different. The people would say, what is it that's going on in you? Not because we're preaching at them, not because we have this giant Bible on our desk, but because his light is within us that we are the salt of the earth, he says. And when Jesus returns in victory to judge, he'll start with us. And so we need to stop and we need to pause and think about the trajectory and direction of our life. Am I living a life that honors and pleases God? Does what I'm about to say or how I'm about to act or respond communicate the heart of Jesus through me? Is my life different because of Jesus or am I just going through the motions? to reflect back on conversations and behavior and thoughts and the actions of my day and say, did my life look like Jesus today? Not so that we can live in shame, it's not that, but it's so that we can come, come to Jesus and say, I don't, I don't wanna live for myself in that old way anymore, I wanna live for you. And so on this weekend, we remember 2,000 years ago when the presence of Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem that holy week that led to his crucifixion. Hearts were changed and miracles were performed and deep relationships were built and sin was removed and parables and stories were told. It was his last week and to squeeze everything in and challenge the deepest parts of people before his death and his resurrection. And what does it look like for you as you enter holy week? How will you allow the presence of Christ to lead you deeper into relationship with him? Will you allow his presence to drive out the sin that you've been wrestling with? Will you allow his presence to cause you to slow down, to pause your life, to reflect on the power and impact of his death and resurrection? What does the grand entry of Jesus look like in your life, in the temple that is you? That's how we start this week. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Lord, we thank you today that you are with us. And Lord, when you came into the city, it was the beginning of a week that had so many highs and the deepest lows. But ultimately, you came to restore us and to save us and to make us like you. And so here we are all these years later, remembering that day, knowing, Lord, that you are you are looking for entry into our life. You are looking to establish your king and your presence in our hearts and in our souls. And so today, we do a, a deep dive and an inner look to say, Jesus, I want my life to reflect you. I choose to follow you. We love you and we thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Would you stand with me? A couple things before you go today. Uh, one, I would encourage you to, uh, to hit this QR code, check out Phil King, check out his new music that's coming out, and just continue to pray for him as God is leading him in some amazing ways, nationally and internationally. Uh, so just continue praying for him. The second thing, Easter is next week. So come to one of the services, bring some friends with you as we celebrate the resurrection. Our Good Friday service here at noon in the lobby. Hope you'll come and be part of all that God is doing. Hey, thank you for being here today. God bless you. Have a great day.